Thank you so much for your time. It's a great honor to see you again. Um, I can't wait for the when you're coming back to London for another breakthrough experience because I'm so looking forward to it again. That was uh, I've been going through the material again, and again, and every time I, I see small uh, things that are big in my life. And tell me, how are you? I'm doing great. I've been busier in the bee. Um, Seems like everybody's going online, uh, conferences, and I mean, we've reached probably 400 million people in the last couple of months, just reaching people. So, doing wow. pretty good. Wow, that's 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 great. How do you do? You miss traveling because I know you were <laughs> traveling 365 well, days. Traveling on Zoom now. <laughs> we, we've had somebody from every country over the last few months easily. We've, that, we've, we're reaching the world in ways we haven't been able to reach. So, it's been a it hasn't been any way of a setback, really. It's been a um, technologically move forward, we're reaching more people now. So whether I'm live or I'm not, I'm, we're still doing it. But when we do get to do it live, we'll be doing those too. That's perfect. That's awesome. And it, it's always, as you always say, there's always a positive and there's always a negative. And now there's, there's, there's definitely able to reach people at strange places. I had a guy in Madagascar on my program the other day, live sitting out over a beautiful river in the middle of Madagascar in the jungle and had Wi-Fi by a satellite and was tuning into the break to experience. And it was, and he showed us the back, back of his place looking out over this river. It's just amazing scenery. And he was in Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> well, th that would never happen if that, you know, th this whole um, COVID didn't start. Exactly. Um, I know you're really busy, so uh, you know I want to make this hour uh, as more efficient as it as it can be. What really I I'm watching and I'm following you on all the newsletters you send, and I always in, uh, try to make people go on your uh, material. You said about what's really important is to fulfill our our seven uh, so mastering our seven true values. Um, seven or, areas. Seven areas. Seven areas. Yeah, which is seven. a spiritual mission, uh, our mental genius, our vocational success, our financial freedom, our uh, family love and intimacy, our social influence, and our physical health and well-being. Yes. Can it be uh, all seven, or can it be two out of them? Can it be three? Whatever, whatever you prefer. I've just never met anybody that wants to limit it. Exactly, and that's my point. They, they, to, they say they want to limit it until I show them how they can do it without having to put more effort into it, and then they go, I want more. <laughs> can we go through them just uh, like a sneak peek? What is our spiritual mission? How can we find that? What is our uh, mental genius? How can we understand what's a mental genius? Sure, I'll go. You just You ask any question... It makes no difference to me. I'll do whatever I can to serve whatever you feel will help people. Perfect. Our spiritual mission. People might be saying now, what spiritual mission? Like I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, work. I'm struggling with, you know, spending time of trying to find my, uh, what actually I'm doing is like, you know, I've got a eight hour job, I come home. That's it. What is a spiritual mission? You know, um, so Jim, if you, if you, whatever you ask me, I'll be glad to cover what help can people find the spiritual mission okay uh, a spiritual mission is whatever inspires the individual you may be a mother who wants to dedicate your life to raising a beautiful family 
And if you feel that that is what is truly highest on your value and what really, really, really inspires you, that's your spiritual mission. There's no rules. There's no dogma. There's no paradigm. There's no religious institution that has to set these. There's no right or moral construct that you have to live by because around the world, there's many. It's what inspires you that brings fulfillment to you based on your own unique hierarchy of values that is inspiring. And the world needs all seven. We can't have everybody just raise families. Can't yeah. everybody just run businesses. Every one of the seven areas of life, which are artificial categorizations that we could define, are needed. So there's no right or wrong spiritual mission. Mine's teaching. What inspires me is teaching, researching and teaching. That doesn't make me right or better or, or worse. It just, it just means that that's what my mission is. Somebody is climbing mountains. Another may be social causes. Another may be running a major business. There's no one thing that is spiritual. In fact, nobody's more spiritual or less spiritual than anybody else. That's a <laughs> false teaching. Yeah, I remember when that. I you said see that people break. say, well, they're spiritual and they're not spiritual. False. No. Whatever is inspiring to an individual that's unique to them that helps them fulfill their life is spiritual. Because I see people, I had a lady come to me one time and she says, well, my husband's not spiritual, but I'm spiritual. I go, what the hell does that mean? You know, <laughs> what, what, because you meditate, you do yoga, that makes you spiritual. And he runs a business and serves 2 million people a year in his business and giving jobs and properties and opportunities to people. Who's to say that's less or more spiritual? That's just, that's not true. And many times it's really wrong and sort of interrupting that spiritual goes with uh, a lot of people think it's religion. And I said, don't put that in. It's so it could wrong. Be. It could be. What you think yeah, is, but that doesn't that's mean. What you love, studying religion and studying a particular religion, that can be spiritual too. I don't want to exclude that, but I don't want to limit it to that. Because uh -huh. I don't think that's fair. I met a guy that climbs Mount, he climbed Mount Everest four times, the seven peaks in the world twice each. Wow. Hiked to the North and South Pole and swam the Amazon River. <laughs> okay. Okay, he's an adventurist. And he asks himself, what is my biggest fear today and how do I go conquer it? That's his spiritual path. Wow. So I, don't, I think whatever inspires you, whatever is absolutely tear-jerkingly meaningful and deeply meaningful that could exemplify and inspire others just by your very action of doing it, as far as I'm concerned, spiritual. Mine just happens to be learning the laws of the universe and teaching them, and that's it. My, mine is teaching. That doesn't make me right or wrong or good or bad, just different. And it can also change because, you know, you were a chiropractor. You were helping people. Then you start teaching people. Then you start traveling and teaching people. No, 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 no. I've been teaching since I was 18 before I became a chiropractor. Okay. So I, that I, was... I taught through chiropractic college. I taught many of the classes I was to take to get my degree. I taught. I was teaching when I built my practice, during my practice, when I sold my practice, before I was in practice, I've been teaching. But I wanted to understand healing as one of the things I wanted to teach and be involved in the healing and physiology, pathology. So I've been doing that since I was 18, teaching. In the healing arts, I first started studying those at age 19, 18, 19. I was studying everything I could and learn everything I could about every form of healing that was out there. Uh, so those were entwined even during that time. I didn't stop one and then start the other. I was doing them throughout the time. And I still speak to a lot of doctors today, but I just don't practice. But I had my very goal when I opened up my practice that I said, I'll be traveling around the world in five years. I'll be traveling full time around the world. And it was only two years I was already doing it all over America. So I had that planned. It was all put together. Because sure. a lot of people will ask, is like, oh, I, you know, I'm 30. I'm like, I'm 37. And wh what am I missing? Why didn't I have something when I was 18? Or am I missing it? I cannot see it clearly. What can be that, let's say, a meaningful goal or that, um, uh, that sign that I need to follow? You know, because sometimes there is so much noise that actually you cannot actually follow what your purpose your, is. Your heart doesn't give you noise. Your mind does. 
and your judgments do. So whenever you compare yourself to other people and look up at them and minimize yourself or look down on them and exaggerate yourself, you're not being yourself. So it's, it's about going inside and finding out what's true for you and looking at what your life spontaneously demonstrates. I spontaneously, whenever I have a moment that's free, I'm on my computer researching and I'm trying to put it into some form that I can use to share it with people. What do you spontaneously do that you love doing that nobody has to remind you to do that you do every day? That's what you want to look at. That's where your path is. That's where that where that's where you spontaneously are inspired to go and get things done. That's where you're going to excel. That's what inspires you. Mine's teaching, learning. So if you look outside, you won't find it. If you look at your own life and what it demonstrates and not lie to yourself, but look at what it is, you'll see that you're Every decision you make is based on what you believe will give you the greatest advantage or disadvantage to what you value most. And what you value most, your life's identity revolves around, and your mission is an expression of that highest value daily. So finding out what that is, is what I help people do. Because once they do, they don't need motivation. If you need motivation to do what you say is important, it ain't important. Because when you're inspired by it, you just spontaneously have called to act, and you don't need to be motivated to do it. I don't need motivation to do it. I've never made motivation in 47 years. <laughs> Doing it 47 or going on 48 years. I don't need motivation. You can find somebody that's had to motivate me about teaching and research. And now you got a free seminar because I don't there's nobody you're going to find. <laughs> <laughs> and also, since I was 17 on that. It's always when you said and I read the values factor so many times and I always uh, like want a present that I'm going to give to a friend or a new client or a patient is that book um because it's shocking that every time i read it it's exactly the things you're saying if somebody like if you say you must to have to it's always it's not your value it's not your it's not your goal so you're always putting more weight on things that actually uh, are weighing you down because they're not yours well people subordinate to conformity and they minimize themselves to people they put on pedestals and they envy and imitate people which is suicide and they undermine their power because they, they think that somehow they brain offload and decide offload by putting decisions and, and uh, you know, information out to somebody they think is already successful. But stop and think about it. If you follow the crowd, are the crowd the Nobel Prize winners? Is yeah. the crowd the, the, the Olympic medalists? Is the crowd the big business leaders or financial leaders or political leaders, spiritual leaders? No. It's the individuals that walk their own drum and became unborrowed visionaries that are willing to walk their own path that became the people that you inspired by. And then when you do that, you realize, I teach people in the breakthrough experience, you know, the program I teach, to, to ask yourself, what is it, who's the most amazing individual that you, you, you kind of, you go, you're inspired by, and find out what it is about them that's so amazing, and then find out where you have that. Nothing's missing in you. I, 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 when I help people see that they think there's something missing them, there's nothing missing them. They're just too humble to admit it. And as long as they play small and they don't admit that they have the power to do something extraordinary, they won't. So I always say to find the people that, you, that are doing extraordinary things. Find out what you admire about them. Find out where you have it to the same degree and dig and go dig it out. Find it out. And then you realize that you were just too humble to admit it, but you have it. Once you do that, you'll stand on their shoulders. You won't live in their shadows. Wow, how how can we do that? What are the steps to take back our life and become empowered? Well, because first, people would say, you know, I read this book, I went to that. Well, uh, for me, I'm, I'm going to say it again. The breakthrough experience was a big, it was an experience. It's the it's as it says on the tin that I will never forget, and I want to do it again. But people are wanting to know what am I going? To, how how well, first of all, any area of your life you don't empower, other people are going to overpower. Yeah. And you're not a victim of their overempowerment. You're just simply not empowered. And as <laughs> long as you blame people, you won't empower yourself and you'll be stuck in a cycle of disempowerment. First of all, you have to take command of your life. Quit blaming things on the outside. Quit running stories and victims of history. Be a master of destiny. Take command. And know that if you don't empower yourself intellectually, you'll be told what to think. You don't empower yourself in business, you'll be told what to do. If you don't empower yourself financially, you'll be told what you're worth. If you don't empower yourself in relationships, you'll be told to do shit around the house that you don't want to do. 
you don't empower yourself socially, you'd be told propaganda that's misinformation. If you don't empower yourself physically, you'd be told what drug to take and what organ to take from all the commercials. And if you don't empower yourself spiritually, you'll fall for some antiquated dogma that's some institution that's basically disempowering you. You have to make a decision in your life. Do you want to be a master? You want to be a victim of history? You want to be conforming and fitting in and fear? Or do you want to get on and do something that's quite amazing on the planet? So the first is the decision. I'm committed to being a master of my life. The second thing is you need to empower those areas. That's going to take learning and education. And if you think you can do it with shortcuts, it's not going to happen. You know, if you if you educate yourself on how to master your mind and use your mind and govern yourself and get specialized knowledge in the thing that you want to master, 28, I've done, I've spent 28,000 hours teaching the breakthrough experience, 1,103 times now. Okay. Wow. Wow. 28,000 hours on one program. So if you were willing to put in the hours, you'll get the outcome. But don't expect something for nothing. Don't expect the free load, the free ride. That's fantastic. Don't expect some magical thing on the outside to make you powerful. It starts within. And it's a decision to go and educate yourself at gaining specialized knowledge on the area that you spontaneously want to learn so you can excel and build momentum, being a real, authentic, knowledgeable individual in the area you want to master. The second is going and being service to people. You care about humanity and you go and find out what their needs are and you figure out a way of serving humanity. You can empower yourself business-wise. And if you don't empower yourself business-wise, you're going to be told what to do. Or you're going to depend on somebody that is running a business and you'll have to be dependent. In any area of your life you're dependent on, somebody's going to control you. And you're not a, it's not a conspiracy out there. There's no big guy out there that's trying to conspire. I've been in 154 countries around the world. I've never had anybody stop me from doing what I want to do in life. There's nothing out there conspiring against me. If I think that, it's my own disempowerment. And the same thing is if you go out there and you care enough about humanity to go out and serve ever greater numbers of people, there's no reason why you can't build a business or make great of, an unlimited amount of resources and use your specialized knowledge to make that difference. And if you go and save a portion of it and quit living by immediate gratification off other people's brands that make you debt and, 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 and buying things that are beyond your capacity and living in uh, credit cards and, and, and foolishly managing money, then you're going to stay in debt all your life and you're going to be a slave to money instead of actually saving a portion, investing and buying assets that begin to work for you. So your money starts working for you as it's, and you become its master instead of a slave. If you do that and live within your means and keep saving and keep serving more people where you can actually invest and build more, you'll end up building a, a compounding effect on the growth of your business and you'll end up with finances. There's no reason why you can't empower that too. I've done that. I lived on the streets when I was a kid. I'm now one of the wealthy guys on the planet. So it's basically because I put the actions into place and I applied them. And the same thing in relationships. Everybody wants to be loved for who they are. Who they are revolves around what they value most. If you care enough to find out what an individual is really committed to, what they're valuing, and find out how it serves you and fulfills what you're valuing, you'll respect them enough to communicate what you value in terms of their values. When you help other people get what they want, they help you get what you want. And you build a whole team of people around you that are empowered and, and assisted by your presence and that want to help you get your goals. And socially, if you go and live authentically and exemplify a real pattern of prioritization and delegation and, and, and momentum building and commitment to something, they'll see that you're a leader. They'll demonstrate your leadership and people will assist you in getting what you want, whatever that may be, whatever it is that's inspiring to you. And if you go and, and, and don't live to eat and be hedonistic and just revolve you around about spending ridiculous amounts of money on ridiculous food and you fill your body with fuel and you eat. To, to live, not live to eat, but you go in there and, and, and fill your body with healthy foods and breathe deeply and drink water and not all this crap that's, that's sold on the marketplace and, and get to prioritize. You'll save money. You can put that in savings and you'll actually perform at a big peak performance. And if you fill your day with things inspired to you, you want to eat wisely to maximize that experience. Potential, and then if yeah. you go out and do something that's inspiring and exemplify that, you'll be a spiritual individual without having to be put into some box. If it happens to be traditional or mystical, great. But if it doesn't, if you want to climb a mountain or if you want to go and, and solve a problem in quantum physics, there's nothing stopping you from doing that and that's your spiritual path. So I'm a firm believer you can empower all of them. I've done everything I can in the last 47 to 48 years to help myself and others do that. I'm living it. I know it's doable. There's no question in my mind that this is doable. I'm living it.
And I know that I didn't start out that way. I just applied the principles that got me there. And I can share those and people can apply those and they can do that if they have the value to do it. But if they just say they want to do something and there's no action, it's not important. And people that want to just talk and want to run their story, I'm not interested in. I want people who are interested in actually going and doing something extraordinary with life and I'll help them. I'll, I'll show them exactly what to do and they'll do it and they'll get a result. And I saw that face to face and I, I lived it and I felt it in my skin with what you did, especially uh, with uh, that woman with that she had a tremendous loss. And to tell you the truth at the beginning, and I know you looked at me and you you winked because I told you it's hard when it's a loss because it, it has to do with tradition. One thing it's biological, it's psychological, it's there's no way you can take that away from a person. And then you made that woman that was miserable. And if we see it from a, from our point of view, as like, let's say, if you're chiropractors, you can see all that stress in her body, how she was folded like an origami in that position. She couldn't smile. She was dark. And in less than 45 minutes, an hour, that woman was full of energy, smiling, stood up, nice posture smile her eyes were clear and you know what i saw that woman three months after and she was the same as I how know. she left i know and that's I, incredible I, I i got rejected i just uh, wrote a book on how to deal with grief and, and i'm i've got a science on grief there's no doubt in my mind i can get resolve a grief i've yet to have a three thousand 570 almost cases that i've done i've not had one not get the result I figured it out and I've got a solution for it. You watched it live. We did studies at Keio University in Tokyo on it. We've done it in live in the earthquakes in, in uh, Christchurch and also tsunami in, in uh, uh, Japan and also another earthquake there. We've gone in, we've shown the relief effort, we've proven the results, but people live in a delusion of the past and aren't ready for a new paradigm. And I'm absolutely certain nobody grieves the loss of somebody they love. They grieve the loss of the parts of the individual they love that they like and admire and infatuate with. And they don't grieve the loss of the parts they resented. <laughs> so I have to differentiate that and take the things they infatuate, neutralize that and level it out. And all of a sudden they feel the presence and they feel love and it's cleared. And I've watched it over and over and I can do it. And I've demonstrated I've been doing it since 1984. And we tried to publish a book on it and the publishers are frightened to do it because what will people think? I said, I don't care about what people think. Exactly. I'm interested in a paradigm and I'm absolutely certain it will work. I think, well, I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to just publish it ourselves. I don't care. I but hope you do it. But yeah, because the, the, the truth is it works. You saw it. I've, I've I do it every it. single week. Every week can I do this thing? And I've been doing it for 3,000 something cases of this. And it's, and it's insane that we sit there and have this prolonged grief syndrome over something that's absolutely not true. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty firm about that. And people, they don't like it, that's okay. You can not like me, you can doubt me. I did it in three universities, three university psychology departments. I did it right in front of them in an amphitheater one time. And they go, yeah, but is it gonna last? I said, follow up on them. A year later, no problem. That's when they finally said, okay, we'll send our students there to try to learn from you now. I said, you're living in an old paradigm. You're living in a biological zoo of a social psychology that's based on victim mentality and wounds, and you're sitting there having sympathy instead of actually getting them in touch with reason and helping them master their lives. And grief, uh, if, if I can add that, is not only losing a person, a beloved one, or family member, whatever. It's grief, what's happening now, 2020, with the, this virus. A lot of people... If you perceive it. If you perceive yeah. a loss... It could be loss of anything, an arm. Uh, I've had people lose arm, uh, eyesight, uh, a child, a uh, death, uh, uh, a puppy. I mean, it doesn't matter what you perceive, you lost money. The same law applies. I can dissolve it. Exactly. And you always say, and I, th that's like, it's, it's haunting me. If you don't fill your day with high priorities, it's going to be filled with low priorities. How can we put our priorities straight? It's your decision. My decision is to research and teach. I've delegated everything off my plate. So I do research every day. I'm writing every day and I'm teaching. I'm teaching podcasts, webinars, live seminars, 
one-on-one -on -one consult to any form of teaching I'm doing. I'm writing books. I'm doing uh, movies, radio, television, every possible vehicle that's out there to teach I'm doing. I fill my day with it. And I'm, and I'm abundantly filled with opportunities around the world. We've, we've reached 400 million people just in a matter of a few months. So I'm absolutely certain that if you fill your day with things that inspire you, it doesn't fill up with low priority stuff. And it produces enough to cover the delegations of that. So I delegate everything else off my plate. I don't cook. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I don't drive a car. I've done that in 32 years. I don't do anything except research, try, travel, teach. Now, everybody else has different things that they want. Mm -hmm. But you can stru structure your life where you can do what you love doing, getting paid to do that, and delegate the rest away. You're not going to have an inspired life if you're doing low priority stuff. You're not going to have self-worth if you're doing low priority stuff. You're not going to be empowered and exemplify and inspire yourself for others if you're doing low priority stuff. You have to be willing to delegate it and let it go and hire people that would love to do what you want to delegate and get on with what your specialty is that you're great at, that you can't wait to get up in the morning and do it. So you can't wait to get up in the morning and be that. Even though biologically we're like, because you love physiology. And I remember when we talked about, because that's one of the courses that I want to do regarding when you, uh, and we talked about that, that you've seen how psychology can affect specific pathologies uh, in our life. And I remember uh, that was when we had our, our personal chat and that was, I, I still, I still want to come to your course so I can delve into that. Um, we've seen many times that actually um, we're not, of course, we're not following our priorities, but we, our biology craves for consistency, craves for routine. And what we've been seeing is people are not following a routine in order to get where they want to get what the, the meaningful goals you need to be precise every day as i as i say to an article i'm writing dear consistency you're the cardinal rule of everything but why are people going against that from your experience for many years why they can spend Most easily days. two three hours on youtube like that but they cannot spend the time they need on the thing they think they want to do what what Anything you're doing that you're distracted from must not be important to you. <laughs> so what yeah. they think is important ain't important. Because if it's really important, they'd be doing it. Whatever they keep getting distracted by, there's something inside that that's more important to them, but they don't know what's important to them. I ask people, how many of you want to be financially independent? Everybody puts their hand up. But everybody's not financially important. <laughs> financially independent. Why? Less than 1%. So people fantasize about what they want, but not look at what their life demonstrates about what they want. So I don't true. go by what you say. I go by what you actually life demonstrates. I look at how you fill your space, how you spend your time, what energizes you, what you spend your money on. I look at where you're most organized, where you're most disciplined, what you think about, visualize, affirm about, about how you want your life that shows evidence of coming true. I look at where you converse with other people about most consistently, what inspires you and brings tears to your eyes. What is the goals that are coming true that you've committed to? And what is it you love learning? I'm looking at what your body and life demonstrate, not what you fantasize. And most people fantasize, I want to do this, and then they keep getting distracted from it because it isn't really what it is. But if you look carefully at what they keep distracting, there's a common thread to it. I, I, I'll give an example, a really good example. I had a woman that came to me. She had a 23-year-old son that she said is a lazy He's just lazy. All he wants to do is sit and watch TV all day. And I asked a simple question. Are you sure he's lazy? And she goes, well, what do you mean? Of course he's lazy. He sits and watches TV all day. He doesn't do what he should do. Should. Which should. is an imperative by another authority. Her value. Her values onto him. So I said, so I said, let me have a chat with him. I said, because I'm not convinced of that. I've never seen a lazy person in my life. I've seen when somebody gets labeled lazy, it means somebody with one set of values is projecting another set of values and expectation for the other person to live in their values. So what exactly do you do every day? He says, I watch TV. I said, okay, TV's too vague. What do you watch? He said, every show, CSI, uh, crime um, solution, what do you call it? Crime, um, forensic. Oh, um, yeah, forensic, yeah, yeah. Forensic. Anything no. to do with crime solving, and mystery solving, he's watching. I said, just out of curiosity, have you ever taken a look at what you actually spend all your hours doing? He says, I know every one of those shows. I watch every one of them regularly. 
I said, is that what you want to do? He goes, yes. The mother said, you want to become an, a forensic specialist? And she goes, yes. Is that why you watch all that TV? Yes. She cried. She hugged him. She says, I had no idea. She said, he says, that's all I want to do, mom. Wow. And I, and she said, are you interested in, in, in getting an education for that? He goes, I would jump on it. Wow. So they sat and they organized that from a student that's uninspired in school and just want to watch TV and college is farting around. He's totally focused now. He was never lazy, but somebody with a different set of values was labeling himself. And he started to believe that they were must be right. I must be uninspired lazy. or something. But he had something common to it. My son is a video celebrity, becoming a video celebrity because he, he loved video games since he was three to four years old. He's 30. So he's now got a following, 27,000 followers going on it. And, he's, and wow. he's doing YouTube. He's doing, he's got 600 YouTube sitting out there now. And he's just doing that. And he's building up a following. He's doing that. And he's commercializing it. That's his business. He wanted to do that. But it could easily be labeled a lazy kid just watching video games all day. But one of his mentors made $24 million in one year doing that. Wow. $24 million. So then when you stop to think about, it, oh, you want me to go and do a paper route job? You want me to go work at McDonald's, get a real job, or follow a guy that figured out how to go and, and reach 18 million people? Watch this guy. Makes $24 million a year. He's got a bigger following than Oprah did. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, the thing is, what exactly is lazy? So I, I find out what it is that's inspiring to them and find out what's common to the things that they think they're getting distracted by. And there's a thread. It may be something social. And if they keep getting being distracted by social stuff, what exactly is it? Find it out and let's structure it and let's build a business around that and they'll excel. I think a lot of people, uh, uh, you've got a lot more experience. I think the problem is the weaknesses in structuring. Well, it's might... the time to structure it because if you're doing a job and you got security, and you don't see how you can produce more, more effectively doing what you really love to do, you'll, you'll stay in that comfort zone. Yeah. But if you can show a pathway and you strategize it, come up with a pathway, then show the benefits of that pathway over the other one, you'll make the move. I do that in the breakthrough experience as I teach the breakthrough. I, 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 I don't even know what I'm gonna face in the breakthrough experience. I'm just gonna take every tool I have and all the experience I have, and I'm gonna help people break through whatever it is in different areas. So I don't know what it's going to be all the time. It could be a health issue, it could be a relationship issue, it could be business, it could be finance, doesn't matter. I'm interested in helping people master their lives. And if whether they want to master in one area or seven areas, I'm interested in doing all seven. I wanted to do them all. I didn't want to do just one. I didn't want to be, you know, great at one thing and, and then not have empowerment in all areas. But at the same time, some people don't believe you can do that, where they don't they they confuse multitasking with super tasking. Supertasking is linking everything together where you're focusing on one thing and getting empowered in all areas. There's no reason you can't do that. And it's, uh, you give an amazing example and we've got a lot of parents, especially and a lot of people saying, oh, my, my, my kid has a, uh, you know, a deficit, a deficit disorder and attention deficit disorder. And I remember the example you gave because, you know, it's been happening over and over again. And a, a lot of cases are increasing, oh, my kid, has this and you give an amazing example it's like when your kid is playing playstation does he have attention deficit disorder so it's so important that what actually you're saying is that we're we if we dig in and we we step back a bit and we just check where we're spending more of our time we're going to find our path and then it takes guts it takes courage to follow that is it the environment? Is it finding a no, mentor? Because you found an amazing mentor when you went to Hawaii, right? Yeah, but that I didn't find him. He just he surfaced. But I yeah. didn't want to look at the time. I just happened to you come up exactly. the right place. But, exactly. but realize this. Fear is an assumption that you're about to experience more drawbacks and benefits. It's your own delusion. There's no fear of the unknown. It's the fear of what you're conjuring up in your mind that you assume is going to occur based on past experience, assuming there's going to be more drawbacks and benefits. But the truth is there is no drawbacks without benefits. No, and that doesn't occur. I've never seen anything in my life that was a terrible event that didn't have terrific sitting in it somewhere. And it took me a while maybe to see it, 
but it was there the whole time. And I just took a while to see it. And therefore I lived in my anxiety and fear over, over an illusion because I never took the time to immediately look, what are the upsides? What's the benefit of this? So if I have the fear, that means I'm not done my pre-planning. I'm not done any due diligence. I've not done any uh, risk assessment. I haven't mitigated the risks. I haven't done any planning and I'm going after a fantasy and then I'm having anxiety. But if you live by your highest values, you're more likely to be an executive center, more likely to think things through and prepare for it. And so if something happens, you can use it to your advantage. Anything that happens in your life is on the way. Ultimately, it's not ever in the way. Wow. Equal positives, because you said now there's there's equal positives, equal negatives. And uh, when I when I a lot of people ask me because I'm your one of your biggest fans and people say, oh, why when Dr. Martini says there are equal positives and equal ne negatives, why bother? Yeah, but indifference and apathy like that is because you're intellectualizing it instead of actually facing it. When you do the breakthrough experience and you actually finish the thing at the very end and you sat there across from the individual, the surrogate, and you realize that there was a balance, you had gratitude for them. There's, exactly. there's a heart open. So what I find is when people intellectualize, they go, well, it's all balanced, but I still want to benefit. So that's why I don't know what to do. When you actually see the drawback of the benefit and break the fantasy that you're addicted to, and the benefit of the upside, the, the, the benefit of the thing you thought was a downside and balance it out, your heart opens and your heart takes you into action and it takes you into action on what you really love to do, knowing full well that the consequences are going to be both. When you get married, you're going to have pain and pleasure, support and challenge, kind and cruel, nice and mean, positive and negative, peace and war. You're not going to get a one sided world. There is no one side where the biggest fantasy that makes people most depressed and disempowered is the fantasy of one sidedness. It doesn't occur. It will never occur. No one's going to have happiness. That the, the biggest depressing thing that people search for is happiness. It's the most ridiculous, childish, immature, cotton candy fantasy that people are addicted to is the fantasy of I want to be happy all the time. No, but emotion, yeah. which is deep meaning, yeah. which is the embracing of both sides of life. If I went up to you and I said that you're always nice, you're never mean, you're always kind, you're never cruel, you're always peaceful, never wrathful, always generous, never stingy, you would go, eh, not really. No. Nah. No, 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 no. If I said you're always mean, you're never nice, you're always cool, you're never kind, you're always negative, you're never positive, always wrathful, never peaceful, always inconsiderate, never considered, always stingy, never generous, you go, eh, not really. But if I said sometimes you're nice, sometimes you're mean, sometimes you're kind, sometimes you're cruel, sometimes you're positive, negative, you would know for truth that that was true. So to expect to be in a relationship with one side and expect to have a goal that's one sided, expect a life to be one side is delusional. It's childish. It's an amygdala in our subcortical area of our brain, fantasizing about avoiding pain and seeking pleasure, avoiding predator seeking prey. You need the predator, believe it or not. You need challenge to make you innovate. You need challenge to make you come up and find out what you're capable of doing. You'll stagnate with ease. You'll stagnate with support. You'll be a juvenile dependent with everybody babysits you and takes care of you and you never have any challenge. You need challenge and you need the predator on your case to make you innovate and create and keep on your toes and eat wisely and not gluttony. So that's the key is to having a balance of both and appreciating both along the journey and not living in a fantasy of one sideness. The sad, saddest people I ever met are people looking for happiness. I wrote a book called The Joy of Depression. I gave up happiness that made me too sad. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, wow. Because um, it's so painfully true what you exactly say because we're actually aiming for one-sidedness and i've got a lot of people coming to me and say like you know i want to i want to be happy and i was like well happiness in order for you to have happiness you need to see the other you, you know in the other side too uh, it's not going to be happy all day then there's going to be a problem with you if you're happy all day either you're on drugs or there's something <laughs> that's <laughs> called drugs and mania but even yeah. a drug that makes you feel euphoric you have paranoia that comes with it you don't exactly. get a pleasure without pain. If you take an aspirin, you get rid of pain. You also get rid of the pot potential to feel pleasure. They don't tell you that when they when you read the aspirin box, but it also suppresses your your pleasure. They go as a pair. They're like two poles of a magnet. The, the the Buddha says the desire for that which is unobtainable, the positive pole of the magnet, and the desire to avoid the the that which is unavoidable, which is the negative pole, of the pennant, the magnet, is the source of human suffering. We, we're trying to get one sidedness. If you embrace both sides of the magnet, you get magnetism. I like to think of it as this really simple exercise. Imagine if I gave you a coin. I don't have a coin with me, but imagine I gave you a coin. It has a heads and a tails. And you said, I just want the heads. I don't want the tails. 
And imagine the number of coins that you accumulate is your self-worth. How many coins are you going to get? None. Because you're looking for a coin that has only one side. You never find it. But no. people do that. They no, go through their life looking for a one-sided, a one-sided coin, thinking they're going to get a one-sided coin, and it's not going to happen. And they're going to torture their lives searching for it. Do you think this era with uh, the coronavirus is a bless and in disguise for? I don't think it's in disguise. I think it's really self-evident. I think it's all around us. I saw pictures of, of uh, New Delhi. I was in New Delhi this last year and it was so stinky and so dirty I could barely breathe. When I saw a picture of New Delhi the other day, since the tra traffic has all stopped, You could see the mountains in the distance for the first yeah, time in so, 35 years. Wow, yeah, I saw that video. That was, that was amazing. Los Angeles has had the cleanest air in, for 18 years. Wow. So it's not, it, it's not that it's hidden. It's all around us. There's, there's, the, the coronavirus has brought many blessings to many people's lives. Yes, it's taken some lives. It's also birth lives. It's also opened up doorways. It's made new innovations. And the people that are thinking about serving people are booming their businesses. So I don't see it as a, as a drawback. I don't see it. I see it as simply a transformation. Frankly, I've been blessed business-wise, economic-wise, social. Almost everywhere in my life has been blessed in the last four months because of this. I've learned all kinds of new things. It's been great. So I can't claim that it's a, it's a terrible thing. I, if, it's, if you choose to make it that way, it becomes that way. But that's only because you're choosing to see the downside without an upside. And just like if you choose to see the upside without a downside, you're deluded. As a fatal attraction, that you know, Michael Douglas had the, only the upsides of Glenn Close when he first met her, and then he found <laughs> out the other side. He was blinded by his infatuation, and you pay a price to fatal attractors. So I'm a firm believer in seeing both sides. No one is one-sided, and, and if you finally look for both sides, that's called an objective. Objectivity means even-minded, balanced-minded. If you have objectivity, you have a balanced mind, you set real goals, you prepare for the obstacles, you, you're ready for them. When they come, you're not freaked out. You're not going, oh my God, it's devastating. No, you're ready. And believe it or not, we've been warned about the pandemics for at least five years now. This has been going on. This is not new. This has been warned. It's been out there. If you look at the literature, it's all over the place. Yeah, this was. is real. This can happen. If you're not prepared for it with cash reserves, uh, creativity, adaptability, uh, taking care of your health, and you're not doing it, you're, you're vulnerable to that. Not just because of the coronavirus, because the coronavirus isn't killing everybody. It's killing a small percentage of people. Mm -hmm. It ain't the coronavirus that's killing people. It's their immune response to the coronavirus that's killing most people. The cytokine storms that are being activated. And that's probably just as much by the media because the media is freaking people out. And they go, oh, my God, I got a corona. And their, their adrenaline is firing. And they're overreacting. You know, I had a, a, a person that's got an immune system that's deficient. And she meditated during the time of getting corona. It lasted for about 14 days to complete symptoms are gone. No problem. I know another person that they got freaked out, anxious, thought they were going to die, freaking out, calling people. You know, they have now been, this is almost four weeks now they've been going through it. There's no doubt that there's psychology affecting this too, not just the virus. The virus is a factor, but it's not just the virus. Virility is not just the virus. It's also the people's immune responses. And you're accountable for your response. So I, my, my advice is to eat wisely, There's a list in Scientific American this month in July edition. It's got a list of things that you might consider doing. Taking zinc and taking A and C and E and making sure you're eating quality foods and getting plenty of rest and things. All those decrease the probability of you having a real complication from the coronavirus. And It's the seventh area yet. of your self-mastery course, well-being yes. and health. Yeah. If you're doing something you love to do, if you're eating wisely, you're drinking a lot of water, you're not eating crap, not drinking crap. You're not uh, putting yourself. See, stress is a is the inability to adapt to a changing environment. Stress comes in two forms: the perception of loss of that which you seek, and the perception of gain of that which you're trying to avoid. So, if you're highly polarized and living in a fantasy, avoid this, seek this all the time. You just added your distress levels, ran down your immune system, and gave power to a little virus that's probably going to be a part of an evolutionary jump for us. It's going, to, it's going to catalyze an advancement in technology and many other things and knowledge. And we're going to say, we're going to call it St. I've been calling it St. Corona since last March, because I still think it's going to bless us in many ways. But I know people are going to go, well, what about all the people that died? Yes, there's people that died for other, just like many other things. There's also been a drop in deaths from other causes that we normally mm -hmm. get because we're not yeah.
getting out and doing all the other things, but we're not paying attention to that. We're not talking about the other kill, the killings that are going on, everything else that's dropped because of the corona. So I, I think that's wise to stop and look at both sides and find the, the benefits of the drawbacks and see, see that it's neither saint nor sinner, neither hero nor villain, neither positive nor negative, neither terrible nor terrific. It's just an event until you choose to narrow your mind into one side or the other and then make it run your life. Do you think uh, that this is going to be a, a, a new era from now on? Do you think we're going to go back to uh, normal? Is this going to be a what's 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 because every time I read your work, I know you're I don't want to say prophet because people are going to get it the wrong way, but I, you, you can see things uh, in the future. What What's your it's already changed. It's already changed. Bit. Think of how many businesses right now just realize that they can do it with less space. Oh, yeah. There's there's probably 70 percent of the businesses out there realize that they can get by with less space. There's may, many more home uh, uh, things which reduce reduce traffic, which will allow people to be with their family more. There's a whole lot of benefits that are going on that nobody's paying attention to. I mean, so I just true. saw an advertisement for backyard business uh, offices, first class, amazing little offices. You just drop into your, your backyard. They, they literally wheel it in and you put it down. Oh, and it's a, I, I saw that. Yeah, it's beautiful. The 33 centimeter uh, square meters. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's a fantastic. And you can work in a backyard, isolate yourself from the kids. They can't even get in. And you can, you can go back there and work <laughs> and then come home for dinner and go back to work. Okay. Now that wasn't thought of until Corona. People have been sitting there driving an hour to work, an hour back, dealing with traffic, having a car, paying that expenses, paying the, the insurance, paying the, the, the fuel, polluting the air. There's blessings in Corona, I guarantee it. It's definitely gonna make us more efficient. So I don't see it as a terrible thing. I see it as an event. All events are neutral till we label things out of our ignorance. What's new with uh, the Demartini Institute? Are waiting for any new books? Do we know when uh, we I'm, can? Uh... I'm, working on, I'm working on E8, which is my the journey to the sun, the the the, the journey of man on his way to the sun to expand himself solar, the solarization of human beings. We've already passed globalization. We're now into space. Right now, Dubai, the Emirates, Ch uh, Tokyo, Japan, China, United States. I mean, there's countries around the world just launched to Mars this week. Four countries just went to Mars. We're in a global going into solarization. So I've just finishing a book up on that. I'll be having to finish by November, um, probably October, on the book on man's journey to the sun, to expansion to solarization. That's wow. an essential part of our, our evolution. We're, we're not going to, we're going to continue to grow. We're figuring out how to go into space and, and colonizing. We're going to do that. It's going to happen. That's real. We're, so we're, looking we're, forward we're to solving that. the problem. I was with special missions at, at uh, NASA in 1987, and we had a 200-year plan to go to, to Mars then. 200-year plan. Look where it is now. That's 1987. That's 30, whatever, 30, whatever it is, three years ago. 33 years ago, it's going to be 200 years. 33 years later, we're almost there. And I, so I, 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 I remember your story, when you talked about years. Elon Musk and the plans you were talking about a year ago, and that no one knew anything and you just said it some some to us uh the breakthrough and we're seeing it now with the satellites and traveling yeah, yeah. it's happening and what's what's interesting is it's it's real it's not just fantasy in the next five years you won't be driving a car it'll be almost illegal for you to drive it'll be <laughs> automated cars that drive more efficiently with less injuries out there driving and transporting and they'll be collectively driving or individually driving. You pay according to what you want, the style, the like, et cetera. And you'll invest in them and own a portion of whatever is transporting. So you'll get made, make money traveling to and fro. There's a much more efficient system out there than what we got there. This thing is gone. We're, the, the disruptive companies are coming in and we're, the, the old way is going out. So yes, there's transformation going on and Corona speeding it up. Last words, because I know you're really busy, to everybody that's going to see this video. Stay inspired through their values with high priorities, not low priorities, in order to find meaning from goals. Well, meaning has been, you know, the mean by Aristotle was the mean between polarities. So if you have a stock market going up and down, the mean was the average. 
So if you go up, finding the downsides, if you go down, find the upsides, that was called extracting the mean out of the volatilities. When somebody can extract meaning out of things, when the things look like it's terrible, they find the upsides. When the things look terrific, they found the downsides and they get back into the center and they extract meaning out of what exists. To me, wisdom is finding the meaning and what's going on. It's what you give it. It's not a universal meaning out there. It's what you give it based on your own interpretations and the questions you ask. And the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. If you ask amazing questions, you get an amazing life. Instead of asking, how can I afford to do this? Ask, how can I get handsomely paid to do it? You know, instead of saying, well, how am I, how am I going to do something in my life? How am I going to make a living? And ask, what is it I would absolutely love to do and how do I make a fortune? Ask new questions, you get a different life. If you need help on the questions, come to me. I'll help people with questions. Make them see things from the ways they never saw before. And then all of a sudden they realize this thing that they've got that's it's an obstacle, there is no obstacle. Every single thing that's going on in your life is on the way, never in the way. But you've chosen to see it in the way and you've used it as your excuse instead of your opportunity and fuel. Dr. Martini, thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, on your next uh, webinars and I uh, hope we have another experience together, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to do the interview. Thank you for joining me at the Breakthrough Experience in London when we were there. And um, thank you for your healing hands out there because it's touching people's lives. Thank you. Thank you so much.